just before 9 o'clock on a bright, sunny morning in Gotham City. The city seems to be carefree and serene, doesn't it? But let's keep our eyes on these little rascals. The old one, too. Beg pardon, boy wonder? Bam! Fade to the jewelry store to set us up for the real knockout later on. Zowie! Robin could be right. Maybe I'm dumb, Penguin, but I don't take this caper. Oh, it's very simple, my little gosling. I'm going to unleash the most bizarre, senseless barrage of umbrellas onto Gotham City. It'll be senseless to everybody but the Batman, whose keen mind will unquestionably piece together the clues to my crime. Well, what crime? What the heck are you planning? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing? Nothing! What do you mean, nothing? I am planning nothing. The Batman's going to do that for me. The Batman's not only going to pick my crime, he is going to provide me with a blueprint as to how I should pull it off. Penguin, are you sure you haven't gone stir-crazy? Why, you bird brain? <laughs> how dare you mark me on the eve of my greatest triumph? Do you really mean the Batman's going to plan our caper? Yes, my fine feathered finks. There's this little plot that I hatched in prison. Hey, wait and see. The Batman and the Penguin are going to be partners in plunder. What's that? Batman and the Penguin partners in plunder? Someone must have flipped his fine feathered wing. He drives Robin by his side. He climbs, guests are say goodbye. Go west, old chum. Go west, old chum. All right, so BB is still on hiatus, and I'm your buddy Roy. Here to, I guess, just just before nine o'clock on a bright, sunny Gotham City morning. Actually, I think it's like uh, what two thirty in the morning. <laughs> the dead of winter. Much more Gotham-y. In the way, I'm, I'm really the Dark Knight, let's face it. I'm not like a real-life Batman. I'm fighting crime right now. Yeah. <laughs> you owe it to yourself to be grateful to me that you're not. What a, what a jerk. You are society and the world. All right. So now we're on uh, episode three, season one of Batman. 1966. Once again, no research will be done. Uh, yeah, yeah, people are milling about. It's nine o'clock on this Gotham City morning. And there's a clock. Tells you it's nine o'clock. Well after he tells you. And we see that this uh, episode immediately, this episode immediately has much more William Dozier uh, narration. All right, so you got these guys who are selling them for their giving uh you know, just giving away umbrellas outside of Ali Bazaar, Alibaba's house of House of Alibaba jewels and watches. So that's where it's nine o'clock, and this business is opening, and people are going to be milling into this jewelry store for business. And all these these umbrella giver awayers that appear to be in uh, bowler hats and black suits with black turtlenecks and black gloves. They, uh, they're giving out umbrellas for free, it seems like. And there's a drawing for prizes, they say, to be held at 9 o'clock. They just popped out of nowhere. You see this, it doesn't seem like. And then, like, you see uh, the people inside the bank saying, that's strange, everyone carrying umbrellas. This actually seems like a pretty good scheme, you know? And the weatherman's like, uh, we were the guy working in the bank. Workers or jewelry store, rather, workers. Jenkins and uh, some other guys, and there's no weather report that says there's rain. He tells them, eh? Oh, yeah, I should look up this on IMDb just in case we need to know anything. I really like the flowers here. Yeah, these guys are like, no rain today. This one is called Fine Feathered Finks, is the name of this episode. Mm. Well, I really like the pastel, uh, the, the the shades in this episode starting out. Like, it's very pretty. wonder if this is the same director as last episode. They've really been doing a lot of pastels. I, there's some kind of hoax with these umbrellas. Yeah, the, the jewelry store guy smells a rat, but too late because all of the... Uh, 
the umbrellas start exploding and confetti and confusion and fireworks. This looks pretty badass to be a part of, but confusing too. It's a real party inside the jewelry store. Then the jewelry store owner, he runs out calling for the police. And then we got Chief O'Hara in Commissioner Gordon's office holding the cool looking beaten umbrella burned in the previous. And these umbrellas that were used in this jewelry robbery. So I guess there was a robbery going on at the same time as this party in the jewelry store. There really was a rat. And it's the mark of a... So Jules, I guess, got smashed and grabbed by those guys in bowler hats. Did we actually see that? Did we just see people partying? Even I was so... Uh, the diversion was so good that he, I didn't even see the place get robbed. Oh. No rain. Uh, he opened the, the first. The guy before he smells a rag tells him to open the door to all the people with uh, umbrellas. Big business. Who cares about these umbrellas? And as soon as business opens, this whole umbrella with the free prizes and drying just uh, drives away in a van. Turns out there will be no prizes. There's one moment that's pretty. Prizes with yet lucky umbrellas. A hoax. A sinister hoax. I hear glass breaking. I don't actually see any glass break. Yeah, they didn't actually steal anything. Nothing got stolen. Just some trick umbrellas. So they say it's the mark of the penguin, and the, and the Commissioner Gordon says that is correct. Chief O'Hare, it is the penguin. The criminal maestro of a thousand ubiquitous umbrellas. Oh, there's only one man alive. They think they could throw the net over this cagey bird. And the Chief Gordon, the Commissioner Gordon, he says he makes it unanimous. They're going to call their only hope. The man under the... the the red phone under the glass case with the handle. He calls Wayne Manor. We see that red phone with one button lighting up on the and Alfred the Butler gets it and he says he'll summon Master Wayne. And Master Wayne and and uh, Bert Ward are are practicing French. And Bert Ward doesn't want to learn French. Yeah, he's really frustrated. Adam West tells him, like, you could heal the Tower of Babel if you just learned all these languages, you idiot. We could bring the scourge of war would be ended forever if we all spoke every language. You need to learn this French. It's key to your life and the lives of perhaps future civilizations that you learn French. And the scourge of war will be ended forever if we all learn French. And Robin has learned his lesson, or Bert Ward has learned his lesson. And uh, so, yeah, Batman says, I guess, good job on learning your lesson. And Alfred comes in and interrupts him with the bat phone. And here we see Adam West. He's got a white shirt and he's got a, uh, what's it, neck neckerchief. He has like a, a tie thing. I guess that's an ascot. Very crazy. It's like small. Maybe it's a necktie just with a weird, no, no, some kind of, he's got something wacky here. And they tell Aunt Harriet, who's Mrs. Cooper, and that should be our second profile in listings. Who was Mrs. Cooper? Let's find out more about her. She was Madge Blake. Uh, unfortunately, much like Alfred and everybody else on the show, she's most known for this. Oh, she's in Ida Lupino's The, uh, the Prowler. That's one of these old movies you get like you see, or even newer movies. Sometimes you like you see a person who's like, they're really miscast. Wow, she had a really, uh, let's look at some of these credits. Uncredited. She was Adam's mother in Adam's Rib. Wow. She was in M, the American version of M. The, as a police station witness, and she was uncredited. This is Joseph Lovey's remake of him. Who played him in this one? It was uh, David Wayne. Interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing that. Then she made, uh, she was in The Prowler. So what I was going to say is that sometimes these people you have in these cats, like you see movies where they try to make David Caruso seem cool, and you're like, David Caruso just seems like he should be playing like filthy pedophiles. It's like in this movie, uh, <laughs> the Prowler. I think uh, a, I, it starred this guy, uh, Van Heflin. And Van Heflin, his thing was that he would just always uh, be really good at things. Or no, he was a, just a really good actor. 
but he would oftentimes be cast as like a heroic guy and stuff. And you'd be like, man, he just doesn't have those matinee idol looks. He looks more like a creep. And so this movie, The Prowler, they used to get good use of Van Heflin. They like had him as a cop, as a creep. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, this movie gets Van Heflin. But he really had a great range. One of the best movies is the old 310 to Yuma, where he has the Christian Bale role. And you see, like, with a, a movie like that, like with Christian Bale, you just expect him to become heroic at the end. You know, you're like, oh, I'm just waiting around till Christian Bale stops taking guff and shows everybody what a big man he is with his shooting and stuff. But in, you know, like the, in the old uh, 310 to Yuma, it's like Van Heflin's a much less like, you know, you don't expect that much from him. I think believe he's also the guy in Shane, Rondo one. So I guess I'm not looking at the career of Van Heflin at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So see, like he would he, sometimes he'd be like, uh, yeah, he's like the dad in Shane. He's not Shane. He's not the guy. He's like the guy you're afraid Shane's wife really is in love with instead of Shane. I mean, instead of uh, him, yeah, you think his wife's going to leave him for Shane, basically. And so when you have him in 310 to Yuma, and it turns out he's like, the in the end, is like a respectable badass and wins everybody's respect and, and is a good shot and shit. It's like, it was actually really effective because you were like, man, yeah, Van Heflin, like, he did, he was an unlikely uh, saver of the day and he saved the day with the help of Lynn Ford, who found a little bit of humanity in him for old Van Heflin. Good actor. But back to this lady, Madge Blake. So she this was, I guess, The Prowler was one of her best roles. She's uncredited in so many movies. American in Paris. A lot of big movies. Singing in the Rain. You know, the Bad and the Beautiful. A lot of Vincent Minnelli. Brigadine. All these crazy titles. She really had a career here. She's uncredited in all of these movies. <laughs> Never any credits. Never now. She's on the Rayma Land show. Good actor, Ray Milland. Uh, she was on the George Burns and Gracie Allen show for one episode as Mrs. Rudy. She's on a show called City Detective in 1934 or 1944, but it's unconfirmed in one episode whether or not it's her. A rare unconfirmed credit for Madge. Uh, Madge Blake. Well, that was crazy last episode when we found out about like the Casablanca that didn't have Elsa in it. I wonder if there'll be anything we'll learn like that this time. She's on the Pepsi Cola Playhouse in 1954 as a librarian. This little TV show's Public Defender. That could be a show now. Public Defender. So yeah, little changes. Studio 57. Yeah, in these old days, you would like before the 60s. Yeah, like you'd have like the general mill like somebody would a sponsor would it, everything would be like spawn con which is how tv of course works with sponsors and stuff but the like a lot of the shows they'd be put together by advertising people to help sell a product and they would find these playwrights and things and hire on plays and you know things sort of developed where it was like okay now we just make tv shows to sell you on coming to us it's kind of how uh, television in hollywood and all these things will pass the movies this is out the, the formation of television and radio basically so you'd buy like an hour's worth of like radio time and you would be trying to get the highest rating possible so like Ford Motor Hour or General Electric Theater and these different shows you know you tune into them for various things and they, some of these would be you'd have the reputation carry over from radio to TV where you'd be like oh yeah yeah I remember these guys were good on the radio now I'll check them out on the television now that I own a television you know so all these old TV shows they have wacky names like the Pepsi Cola Hour it's like not an hour about Pepsi Cola Lord, I hope. The Joseph Cotton Show. Well, I've spent the night a few times in Joseph Cotton's old um, house in, uh, in uh, what's-his-face, that place, Palm Desert. Let me tell you something. That's a cool house. Joseph Cotton had taste. That shit was a freaking nice little house with, like, little riders in the weird grooms and stuff. The open area in the middle, like, with a, there's a bar. He's probably uh, like to do some entertaining yeah, there's definitely a place for drinking. It's a it's a pretty happening joint, but also a place with like where you could hide away and write and write or have guests. Yeah, there's a pool. 
very very cool place gotta say if you i think it's on uh airbnb perhaps parts of the year you could rent it out for cashella or something it's probably pretty fucking expensive let's see here i was a guest <laughs> ah, i paid nothing enjoy that uh swimming pool maybe now oh, this is spawn con i'm telling you to to buy the uh the swimming for to go rent this place yeah <laughs> this is the uh airbnb hour with the joe bishop sh show member of the rat pack he's on dr kildare a tv show i guess not as familiar with but you always say like, oh, from dr kildare she's on the jack benny program benny was funny she's on the man from uncle my favorite martian dick van dyke show mon mccluskey the trouble with angel uh, eight secret agents of batman now this is actually probably one of her final credits out of a long career so this is this is going to be one of the most things in fact she went back to being uncredited on an episode of manix 1967. <laughs> so so back to the show alfred he's telling them they're going to go bass fishing he tells mrs cooper played by match blake that they're going to go bass fishing and what she says is, uh, who told them the bass were biting this time of year? And Alfred says, I cannot tell a lie, madam. It was me. So he's, um, she's lying the whole time to her. What a piece of shit. How's that Mrs. Cooper? I'd fire this fucking Alfred. So, so they answer the phone and Commissioner Gordon, or when I say they, Adam West answers the phone and Commissioner Gordon tells him uh hey it's the penguin and he's like i'll be right there so we get the the bat cave and we get this this but they're gonna go down to the bat cave with the poles that say dick and bruce access to bat cave via bat poles so if you broke into the wayne manor you would know where the bat cave you know where these poles go to you'd be like oh i'm gonna go to the bat cave well and you'd know that uh bruce wayne was in fact batman ah very very nice and when they well, they take the poles, they jump on their respective poles, respective and labeled. We go to the opening credits with our hot California jazz, Batman. It's that Batmobile oozing through the Gotham days and nights. Hollywood, Los Feliz, Santa Monica, Franklin Village, Larchmont. The Sunset Strip. Then we come back from um, commercial, and they're in the Batcave. And they jump into the Batmobile. What's the Batmobile license plate? That's what well, I'd like to know what the what the exact digits are. Okay, two F three five six seven Gotham. That's a trivia question. Two F three five six seven. Fine feathered finks. Guest star Burgess Meredith. Written once again by Lorenzo Simple Jr. Directed once again by Robert Butler. He did it again. So now they ran into police station and Batman examines the glo the, uh, the globe and tells them that, yes, in fact, umbrellas are a perfect cover for a holdup. And yet it was no holdup. I was right. Nothing got stolen. It's a fake robbery. Oh, man. Robin uses a lot of boxing terminology here saying that. The, the the pink one is gonna bam Phantom at the jewelry store, and Zowie, the real heist is somewhere else, and Batman has to calm calm Robin down. <laughs> He's like, you take 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 it you take it easy there, buddy. Batman's not sure there is or gonna be is gonna be a robbery. He thinks it might be a practical joke. And boy, Chief O'Hara's face is not. Uh, seem credulous that man thinks that uh the prison system has reformed the penguin but chief o'hare has no faith so they go to they call the prison uh gotham penitentiary warden warden Crichton, and commissioner gordon actually you know this is for the first time he, other than calling batman which is always good sense he uses good sense here and has already prepared and thought of something like batman would want to question the the the, the warden of the prison so he's already got warden cragged in there to talk to batman because he knew that batman would think that the penguin was reformed or at least would want to talk to this warden now this is our first introduction to warden cragged 
I don't know if he warrants a profile in Westing yet. <laughs> we should at least say who plays Warden Crichton. Let's see here. Yeah, David Lewis. <laughs> I think it was like like the guy that lived down the hall in the, uh, the movie The Apartment. And he's in like the old absent-minded professor movie with that. Uh, watch his face with Fred McMurray. Let me tell you something. This guy, I don't want a major spoiler here. He's not the greatest of reformers. And he's been rushed down by helicopter. Well, maybe he wasn't the neighbor in uh, the apartment. Maybe he was the boss. Yeah, he seems like he was probably the boss in the apartment. So the warden has implemented video. And what he does is that before he releases felons, he puts them in a private cell, these felons. And he studies them on videotape. And so... But there's no tape, and so Commissioner Gordon's like, "What the fuck did you did you forget the tape?" <laughs> Guyton's like, "No, I left it at the communication center when I arrived, and they're waiting for a signal to turn on this tape." Like he's like playing a cue, like they're on the freaking like Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, closed circuit TV shows videotape the clip of <laughs> roll the clip of the penguin, and so. First thing you notice is that Penguin's just dressed as the prank penguin in prison, and that's another. And that's another uh, one of the things is when they're in there, when they're in the this final phase, he lets them wear their own clothes to help them become deinstitutionalized and reacclimate themselves to the outside world, feel more like a human. And uh, Batman's very approving of that. He says that is sound technology. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got video penguin says saying that the prison his prison spell is has been wasted because uh because he hasn't set up one good score for when he's on the outside and this guy right in says his mother-in-law owns a candy store the guy's he's not really in a private cell the penguin by himself he's in there with like oh uh, he's in there with a with his stooges. It's a good way to observe a guy, rather. So we see that Penguin actually is, wants to plan a caper that will really annoy Batman. This is not just a practical joke. So we got the uh, Penguin's guy. He says if Batman was a crook instead of a law guy, his words, they would turn this world inside out. And that gives the Penguin an idea. I like... Burgess Meredith's really fantastic as the penguin right here in this scene. He's, he's, he's acting almost as hard as Frank Gorshin, not nearly. He's not as quite as cracked out, but he's very over the top, but also very good. I don't know, I'll tell you, Burgess Meredith, of course, we know him for so many things. Much more than Frank Gorshin. We know Burgess Meredith from Up Mice and Men, where he was George. And we know him from uh, such films as. Day of the Locust, and we know him from such pictures as the Rockies, the Rockies, the Grumpy Old Men movies. He was there. He was the even older guy. He was kind of the the Skull Getty, if you will, to their golden boys. And sometimes they would invite a lady like uh, Aunt Margaret to be in those two pictures. She would be much more attractive than than uh, Walter Matthau, physically. I'm sure he was a great, great, great nice guy. And then we would have, uh, so we've got Bridges Meredith. Oh, yeah, 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 here's the crazy thing. He was like a big hippie, I think. He liked to do a bunch of acid and whatnot. He liked to do a bunch of drugs and hang out and party. And he, was a, and he would uh, hang out with... Um, in the science and stuff, getting his mind blown, man, hippie culture. And he would hang out at the Echo Lab with John C. Willie, MD. And he would get into the hanging out with the dolphins. John C. Willie, of course, the inspiration for the film Day of the Dolphin, and also the film Altered States with William Hurt. And he's also the inspiration of the Genesis game Echo we've established before on their Robbins program. So, 
Burgess Meredith was a big supporter of all this. And he, and he was in a movie called 92 in the Shade with William Hickey, Peter Fonda, and Warren Oates and Margot Kidder, in which I'm sure if you watch the movie and Harry Dean Stanton, you're like, boy, I, I don't know how much sobriety could possibly have occurred on the set of this film. Look at this cast. All these people like to party, party way too much. Well, I don't know. It's like maybe just enough because Peter Fonda and Warren Oates and Burgess Meredith and Harry uh, Dean Stanton and all those guys. That sounds like a pretty damn good time with some pretty damn good actors, actually. Kind of an interesting movie, not, not one of my favorites. It's one of those things where you're like, I'm not sure this should be a movie. <laughs> about 92 The Shade is about like competing uh, fishermen, but with like violence like violently competing with turf to, to guide people in the Everglades uh, National Park fishing trips, like guiding, being a fishing guide, these two different people. Like, it's like just about the, it's like day in the life of actual fishing people with like melodrama or something. It's, it's strange. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a low red. Oh, uh, it's, a, it's an odd one. 92 in the shade is an odd odd movie it's not cynical i'll tell you that yeah i'll tell you what about 92 in the shade it's not a good movie and you feel like these people's time and perhaps your own will be better spent doing something else however it's the kind of art movie like it's it's an indie art it's not maybe what you call an art movie because you wouldn't go see it in a museum unless it was part of some kind of like retrospective like somebody died or was being honored they would, I don't know, they would be like you've got to see 92 in the shade this way, you know, wouldn't be a big event. However, or there wouldn't be probably like this is high art. But uh, to me, it's the kind of art film, like art house movie, B movie, that I'm glad I live in a world where it exists. Like the kind of thing, like it. It's like I watched that movie, like some of these movies from Europe and stuff and whatnot. And some of them, you're like, eh. I don't know if I like living in a world with people. Are living the kind of lives that bring them together to make to a live the stories in 92 in the shade and b tell the stories in 92 in the shade and i uh i do like living in a world where 92 in the shade exists yeah i'm, I'm pro that throw it on that a level not a great movie but I like, I like it in some way. The penguins paid us drive from Cyrus. I need to check on my sweet potato. There's been a four points bulletin and the Robins now turned against them. They're like, Commissioner Gordon's like, he's paid his debt to society. We can't really like get on the penguins ass too much, even though we know he's really, I guess, not reformed. That's why I brought the fucking tape. It's like people, people are always pulling a fast one on you on that. So I'm gonna pull a fast one on checking on, I've been baking a sweet potato. Let's see how it's going. I'm going to tell you two things for sure about that sweet potato. One, it is far from being done. Two, I'm already enjoying eating it. I like sweet potatoes. The Batman says whatever is whatever the penguin's ploy is involves umbrellas. That he's given away. So there are three new umbrella factories. None of them are in the name of Penguin. And Robin thinks of the idea, maybe he's using an alias. So now we're going to read back these names. So we've got, uh, <laughs> let's see here. We've got R.L. Howard, K.G. Bird, or E.P. Sherlock. Hmm. I don't need to be a Sherlock to deduce. One of these sounds fishy, or should I say the foul. K.G. Bird, eh? Robin gets it. And then Commissioner Gordon's like, it's practically transparent that they're at 196 West 7th Avenue. Not much. 196 West 7th Avenue. Boy. And Batman immediately is like, let's go there, man, because my name's Adam West. So we see KG Bird and Company, makers of superior umbrellas. Yes, I think their sign could be better. It's not my favorite thing I've seen. I like their 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 bird with the various colored umbrellas, but it's not not maybe my favorite. But once we go inside, I do like what we're seeing here. 
I don't know if uh, if I was actually to make my own version if they were like, hey, direct Batman, if I would be doing it with so many pastels. But uh, hell, I love pastels and I love uh, pastel movies. This is, you know, like, I just don't associate it with uh, Batman or comic books. I associate comic books with strong, bold colors, red, blue. In this movie, you know, this show is not all blue. Not all red, there's some red. That's one thing, like when a color pops out on this, it doesn't seem to be the best choice. It's a gold, silver, and metallic shade. <laughs> and he has a cuckoo clock that tells him at the signal what time things will be. But a penguin comes out of the cuckoo of an igloo for his clock. That's cute. You can imagine it's probably made specially for the show. Probably doesn't work at all. Well, I think it took like five minutes to make. Oh, you see shit on here and you're like, that looks pretty good. It's like, boy. Pretty sure we could make this igloo clock thing with a uh, penguin come out of it. Like, boy, this is one of the least impressive things I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, you gotta make a little groove in there. Somebody's just pushing it through a wall. <laughs> in retrospect, I, I gotta say, I like it quite a bit. He has like a version of the Maltese Falcon in here that's like a penguin, <laughs> a bejeweled penguin. See, I think like in Frank Gorshin, there's a neediness of it. There's just the insanity that Burgess Meredith is like, uh, has a cool, that he's like over the top and hammy, but there's a, uh, but he really does feel very self-confident in a way the Riddler does not. Yeah, he says Batman's going to provide a penguin with a blueprint of how he's going to pull his own plan off. And they're like, I mean, you've gone crazy. All penguins, henchmen, they're named after birds. They're like Hawkeye, Sparrow. So the Batman, so Penguin has taken that idea from his, his that he got in prison. That he wants to bring bring Batman in to be his partner in plunder. And William Dozier says someone must have flipped his fine feathered wig. And so there's another umbrella giveaway outside of Bank now. And they have to initiate the bat turn. The bat turn leave alone. They get even better with this. This one is even better executed. You can see that uh, William Butler. He he really this emergency turn here. On the like, well, look, 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 they're on the universal lot here or something, and box lot, whatever. They're on, they're on a studio lot of some variety here. Who produced the old Batman program? I don't know. At any rate, so now we got the bank. So then there's uh, Batman runs in, and there's now there's another exploding. They they beat us the punch. There's another exploding uh, umbrella thing in the bank. And it shoots out through a blanket. They cover cover the umbrellas and smoke, and it it all dissolves itself. No one runs for the exits, and there are no no robbers. There are no robbers. It's another perfect setup, and no robbery. They don't know what the what the penguins' uh, scheme is, but Batman more than ever wants to talk to him now. So maybe he will want to go in partners with Penguin. We'll see. So they have carrier pigeons, senseless bank signed swoop, right? It's important to know here we have the carrier pigeons. Let's look at this because I think there are, are there carrier pigeons? Isn't that in um, Pigeon? I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find it in, in this. We got the passenger pigeon. It's also known as the carrier pigeon. It's also the passenger pigeon. What's the difference between a carrier pigeon and a homing pigeon? Homing pigeons are often mistakenly called carrier pigeons because they think they carry disease. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because the word carrier. Oh, check this out. So carriers are not. Carrier pigeons are not messenger pigeons. The carrier pigeon was bred for its beauty and the homing pigeon for its speed and ability to always return home. So here's the thing is that the penguin has the wrong kind of pigeon after all. He needs homing pigeons, not carrier pigeons as well. <laughs> Looks like we've outmasterminded the penguin on this. So the bent senseless bake caper was completed and Batman is on his way back to KG Berg and swoop 
has sent the message. So the penguin has his own, like, it's like, just like Wayne Manor. They're all like, like he has his own slide away door, but he has no poles. And let's see what, what his slide away door says. Slide away wall, false wall. He doesn't have a bookcase because he's not a man actually of learning. He has actually like a door that just slides through a crazy way. And uh, there's just some other wall behind it. So oh, it's an umbre it's an elevator. It's a secret elevator to the umbrella shop. Uh, it's just supposed to be a secret elevator, but it has a door in front of it. One of the least disguised false walls I've ever seen. <laughs> so they say they're gonna they're gonna fly the Robin. They want to bring bring a penguin downtown under a lot of what well, sound like pretty mild uh charges assault and battery wait that's not mild at all selling illegal umbrellas even worse disturbing the peace why they got enough certainly for him violating parole ah so penguin says no actually i just make umbrellas sir whatever these people who buy my umbrellas do with them that's their business why you don't arrest the colt manufacturer for making a gun or a horse or a penguin <laughs> so batman says we're gonna watch you penguin you've outsmarted us he admits the penguin has outsmarted him i gotta say i do like the penguin shop color and some setup here this umbrella shop seems like a cool place to shop for an umbrella I'm like hey where do i need to buy umbrellas one of the three umbrella stores that's just opened itself in town. And we got a rooftop umbrella launcher. How many umbrella stores and manufacturers have opened recently? Wow, a lot, as they always do. And then he's got a huge umbrella drops from the sky with a miniature umbrella on her handle. Or perhaps a regular size. It is a very massive and it stops traffic. And they think it might be an explosive umbrella. It looks like an art installation. It's kind of pretty. Umbrellas are pretty. Hmm. So Batman thinks this could be a clue to the Penguin's game, this huge umbrella. So he's going to use the Batarang to fly up and get this miniature umbrella. And it wraps around this huge handle. This is a massive, massive umbrella, which I believe they actually had to make. For all the time, it didn't seem like they ma took making the... Uh, the other thing they are like oh and now batman's climbing again oh we've got it we've got batman batman's not climbing with robin this time robin's at the bottom of holding the rope and just telling him to be careful while he climbs this time oh man so we're, we're in episode three we're already on our second climbing uh, and he got the umbrella and it's a special bat umbrella made by kg bird maker of superior umbrellas so they have to take it back to the bat cave to analyze it. Wow. And officers show up at the scene and Batman tells them to carry on because now he's in charge of them. And he goes back to the bat cave. Damn, they really made the Batmobile uh, once again look very awesome. And there's a safety lock. Oh, yeah, he's up on the. Uh... He's up on the um, atomic pile where Jill St. John got killed last episode, dusting. <laughs> and they're like, be careful, Alfred. And he's like, no, I set the safety lock on the, the atomic pile. I will not be following. And there's a nice light up sign to tell us. So he has a safety lock that is operative. Beep, beep. Now they said, don't worry about Alfred, old man. Let's get back to this bat brello. So Robin's going to analyze some fabric, and Batman's going to analyze a rib of the umbrella. And they go to the hyper spectrograph. This is pretty good. They go to the hyper spectrograph and spectrographic analyzer, hyper spectrographic analyzer, and the chemoelectric secret writing detector to to study these things. And Robin wears this uh this crazy glasses too. No secret writing. And the bat brella ribs are made of perfectly normal chrome magnesium alloy. So Batman and Robin want to perhaps illegally wiretap the penguin. They've got electronic bugging devices. And they're they're actually like fishing lures or you know, they're rubber they're rubber bugs. Perfect lifelike spiders. 
not a spider. It's a tiny microphone, a Pilgrim Superpower microphone. So he's going to drop a fake spider in the penguin's umbrella shop. But how will Batman get away with planning it? He'll have to visit the shop as Bruce Wayne. Boy, it seems like a great way to keep your thing covered. Hopefully he won't be a surveiller being surveilled with some kind of thing watching. Uh, here is Adam West comes in. Let's check out what 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 uh, Adam West is wearing here. Before he had that crazy neckerchief and the white uh, shirt and, and navy slacks. Conservative, but with the uh, crazy neckerchief, it was very crazy. Ascot. Okay, here he's in more of a, like a, uh, what do you call it, a plaid jacket. And he's got a crazy uh, hat. And he's got a cane. And he's got gray trousers. He's got a red, uh, he's got a white shirt, maroon kerchief. I'm not a big fan of this outfit. It's okay. This is like something I'd wear to church and not feel like I really like set the world on fire unless I was looking good. I guess Adam West is probably looking pretty good. I do, uh, I do think I actually probably own most of the clothes in this outfit and wear them. Depending on how fat I am, I feel pretty good or bad. I don't wear this crazy hat or, or carry a cane. Or I, I guess it's an umbrella. He has the bat umbrella. So, so, uh, so what I'm thinking is, if he has the bat umbrella, oh wait, it's not the bat umbrella. It's an old umbrella, and he's looking for an artisan to repair it for him. And so, Penguin's going to study how this good old umbrella is apparently broken. Man, this does make me want to try on my clothes. This is one thing about Batman. Bruce Wayne makes you want to put on clothes. Fashion show. So whoever this guy is, that's, oh wait, hmm. So he immediately busts uh, Batman trying to bug him because he has an anti-bugging machine. But he busts Adam West trying to bug him and he thinks Adam West is actually from a, from a uh, rival umbrella program outfit. Yeah, he's got him covered in a net and then he knocks him out too. So he has no idea who he is. He thinks he's an rival umbrella king trying to steal his precious secrets. This is a good case where we see that the penguin has like crazy gloves that are very penguiny. And a penguin, like, his outfit isn't just like a suit that's been tailored for him. He has like a covering. It's like he's half. This penguin is very much like he's like a, a mascot without a head that wears a suit over the mascot body. It's strange. Or maybe not, but it really just seems like it's like a weird front for his suit. Where, and he has like special, yeah, a special made front for his suit and gloves. But it does seem like uh, strange. It also seems like, yeah, very just very strange. Strange choices. Not, not perhaps as dashing a dresser as the, as the Riddler. Not as much personal style. Although his umbrellas seem quite nice. Yeah, he dresses kind of like, uh, I'd say like an old money bags, but with some purple off offshoots, purple for penguin, and then it's like some bizarre softness for his belly and hands to make him more like the animal the penguin so they're gonna throw adam west in the in the uh in the tempering furnace where they flash and their umbrella ribs wait yeah so they're gonna take they can't have a guy snooping of that day, that today of all days because it's like today he was gonna jail the batman his greatest blow <laughs> So they don't want to throw them in the river. They're going to throw them in the tempering furnace where they forge umbrella ribs. <laughs> when we get the title of the episode, he calls his henchmen fine feathered finks. And they carry away Bruce Wayne, but not into the secret elevator. Penguin takes the elevator alone and they carry him to another room. <laughs> and they say it's a shame they're killing this guy instead of Batman. There are some bad guys. And they turn on this conveyor belt with a start. It has a start and a stop switch, which you'd think just turning it on or off. But I guess you got a start and a stop. And now we're at the end, I think. We've got great uh, William Dozier. Mm, and we got flames at Adam West's feet as he's on the conveyor belt about to go into that kiln. Yeah, we end episode one, or episode three, as it were. <laughs> Batman. William Self was in charge of production. Now we're on to episode four of season one, which is the Penguins of Jinx. Fine feathered Finks, the Penguins of Jinx. All right. 
out of sight. I love William Dozier. In the last Bat episode, we saw a grand opening with a big come on. Then pandemonium. The telltale umbrella, the mark of that old devil penguin. The bat call was made. Batman leapt into the fray against the penguin and his fine feathered finks. What was their plot? A bank job? No, another red herring. And then, a monster umbrella with a clue attached, baffling to the dynamic duo. They decided to bug the tricky bird. The bug was planted and the penguin was bugged. Batman was trapped and ready for the barbecue. It was getting very warm. But wait, the worst is yet to come. The bad call was made. <laughs> Some of the still frames from this episode are pretty good. The smoke around the, the penguin's face there. The guy's hunched in. <laughs> when they're looking at the clue for the umbrella, the the uh, the Batman's face is really funny. Adam West was looking funny, and he's ready to be barbecued here. All right, and we get after William Dozier, we get the opening credits again. The worst is yet to come. Usually true in these. Oftentimes, the fun is a lot of times front loaded into these two parters. It's like they. They resolve things and win in the end, but a lot of the fun of, of the two episodes in episode one, the setup and such, seeing who, how they'll be, be interfaced with by uh, the criminal that week. Penguin's Jinx. Special guest villain Burgess Meredith as the Penguin. Doing a great job. Like you can see the our first Batman's, like we'll see as it wears on, like Commissioner Gordon and Chief O'Hara and Alan Napier, like everyone's at the top of their game, really giving it their all. Like they're not acting like they're above the material or even in on the joke. There's a there's a dryness and funness and commitment. The Peng Penguin's henchmen in this are also pretty good too. I would say this episode's, if not as high budget as the uh, one with Frank Gorsh and the pilot, it's at least, uh, it's perhaps more assured. Let's see, we've got homing TNR, we've got U.S. and Canada crime photo profiles, all kinds of intergalactic recorder. Yeah, seeing these different things. And Alfred hopes that, that Robin's looking for Batman at, right in the Bat Cave, and Robin, um, Alfred rather, hopes that Batman has not fallen into a hot spot. They know where it went, and Penguin's watching Adam West, but he laments that the heat is waking Adam West. Not because it'll save him, but because he might try, like, not because like he'll be feeling the pain of death, because he might try to save him, so that's why... His awakeness is alerting to the penguin. And the penguin feels like he's seen him someplace before now. It seems so familiar to him, even though earlier he said he had no idea who he was at the end of episode one or three. <laughs> and he gets out a cigarette lighter and he says, and he said, uh, and Batman, oh, Adam West, produces a butane lighter. A Zippo lighter, it looks like, but we don't know the brand. It's a, it's a, it's a similar make. And um, they say, boy, this guy needs a, a lighter like an ass, needs a, a hole, another hole, whatever, right? And they say, yeah, it's not a good, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not a very good metaphor. Or a simile, it's not a very good simile. And uh, it's not what they said either. They said he needs a cigarette like a, like a moose needs a hat rack. That's really good. But Penguin says that, you fool, that lighter is the same kind I use. It has a lifetime supply of butane gas compressed inside. And if he manages to toss it into the furnace, 
which we cut back out in West, and he does manage and rolls away off the conveyor belt, and smoke starts pouring into the umbrella shop and blows up, I guess, their kiln. Oh. So they, he's getting away, and the Penguins men, they want to go after him with machine guns and just gun him down. And the, like he's like, no, 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 let's get this guy get away. And they're like, hey, won't he just run to the cops? We just tried to murder him. And he's like, no, he can't because he's a crook himself. He came in here to bug us. He doesn't want the cops to know nothing about what he's doing. But he won't come nosing around there anymore. They were so into killing him before. And like, why didn't they just try to kill him again? They need oh, because the penguin needs his henchman nearby because that uh, time is almost nigh. We're at 5.20, 40 minutes, so at 6 p.m., there's a built-in timer that will send a bat brell into action. You need his henchmen there for all 40 minutes. They could, Time cannot be spared to run outside and shoot Adam West. So it's two minutes till six. Robin's going to give Adam West two more minutes to touch in. Then he's going to call the police commissioner. And uh, Adam, how oh, does Alfred say he should give him the two minutes? Uh, so like he says, yeah, the police will probably do a most effective search. But immediately, without even two minutes going by, Batman comes sliding down a bat pole. Boy, I hope it's his own bat pole. Can we go back and look and make sure it's the right one? If we, if we, try, if we look upstairs, I, I think, you know, like it's hard to say because they would be under the house. We have to know which way the house opens out. But we have to, we, we can imagine that. I guess well, there's no way for us to know if you took the right pole or not. But you have to imagine Batman would always take the right pole. To imagine that Batman would be too uh, dazed or hasty to read his own labeling and and take the poll that was his and not the one for master dick that would just be uh that would just be insane one thing i like and one thing i don't like i'll start with the bad news is i don't like that we're only in episode three and we're already having the criminal use a fake crime to trick batman but i do like that we see different ways of building a criminal plot with the different criminals they have different modus operandi you see the riddler he leads batman like on one riddle inside another to strip away and if you can guess to the end you can stay out of the riddler's trap and you can also figure out where he's going to heist but he's got double meanings and stuff and he's definitely trying to trick you and give you red herrings and things However, the penguin, he does the same kind of crime in different parts of the city where he doesn't set off the crime. It's like he, he doesn't set off the crime. He doesn't set off the crime. It's like he's building a circular wall of ice in which to encase Batman and lead him to where he wants Batman to be, which is hopefully not the same place the heist is going to be. Hmm. So they have to solve the bat brella mystery with the, themselves because the, the the bug didn't work. Now it's 6 p.m. It's after 6 p.m. now. So let's see how the penguin's gimmick is working. He pulls up uh, what looks like a roll top desk with a lot of like radio stuff in it. And he's got a but he's planted a bug. He has a secret. Okay, see what happened is he had the radio transmitter put into the no he had a radio transmitter put into the handle of the bat brella so when they checked the rib and when they checked the thing they didn't they didn't check the handle that was stupid very very stupid we'll have to solve the mystery of the bat brella ourselves right let's muster all of our brain power let's talk of this let's see how my gimmick is working gosh batman this is sure a tough one. Jumping chimney, it's the boy wonder. It's my most dazzling stroke. A secret radio transmitter built into the handle of the bat umbrella. I wonder if these colors mean anything. The colors are certainly striking. Could it be the penguin's way of taunting us with a clue to where he's going to strike? Hey, you've got something. This green could stand for money or emerald. Or is it all the colors taken together? You mean like a collection of gems? The jeweled meteorite on display at the museum. Oh, <gasps> wow! Studded with emeralds and diamonds and rubies. The penguin's favorite bird seed. 
could he get at it, though? Just a sec. We'll check the plans of the museum. What did I predict? Batman has picked our crime. Next, he'll tell us how to do it. You're a real genius. Shh. Gotham City Museum. Third floor plan. Impossible. Burglar proof. Not even the Penguin could get through those security devices. Scratch the jewel meteorite. Back to the Batrella. Curses. That sounded like a sweet caper. Fear not, dear Finks. I know Batman's fertile minds. He'll come up with another. I still think the clue must be in the colors. They're so pretty. It's like a beautiful dawn. Beautiful dawn? Huh? Don Robbins, the beautiful movie star. She's on location here in Gotham City. Holy popcorn! Could he be planning to kidnap her? Don Robbins in a picture called The Mockingbird, produced by Ward Eagle, and she's staying in the penthouse at the Pelican Arms. One dawn gone, but then another comes. I can see how they made that mistake. I mean, even if you go to rib or or secret writing, certainly nothing in the handle. It was one of the colors on the. They're saying the colors in the umbrella are clue themselves. Like the green could stand for money or emeralds, or is it all these colors together, like a collection of gems? So they think they think maybe this multicolored uh, umbrella is to tell them about the jeweled meteorite that would have lots of colors on it. It's studied with the the umbrella is studded, not the umbrella, but the uh, meteorite is studded with diamonds and emeralds and rubies, which Robin says are the penguin's favorite type of bird seed. They're going to check the plans of the museum. And Penguin says, Penguin says, uh, so what they're, they're going to try to figure out, Penguin's going to do this. And they're going to go find the plans to the, um, to the, uh, museum. And so that where the meteorite is being held, see how the penguin could possibly break in. And the penguin's cracking up because he's like, Batman just picked our fucking heist and now he's going to tell us how to commit it. Batman has the Gotham City plans and views. He says there's no way the penguin can get through. They can't be trying to trying to rob that. <laughs> and penguin's like, damn. He's like, Batman will come up with another heist for us. Clue must be in the colors of the umbrella. And Robin thinks there's the colors are so pretty in the umbrella. It's like a beautiful dawn. And Batman thinks he's going to steal the sun. No. He's going to steal Dawn Robbins, the beautiful movie star. And she's on location in Gotham City. And he thinks the Penguin's almost certainly is going to do it because she's staying in a penthouse at the Pelican Arms and she's making a movie called Mockingbird produced by a man named Ward Eagle. Eagle. So Bert Ward is a ward who's about to thwart a crime and perhaps help commit it unwittingly of another ward. Ward Eagle. This is the most penguiny scheme of all. It cost Eagle thousands a day. So now they're going to take plan, take notes on how Batman thinks the that the penguin would plan to to hijack this girl. So they're going to look at the penguin arms, the or the pelican arms view of this hotel of this apartment building. We get some nice. Uh, drawings of the, the empty Gotham streets and what the, the building would look like. Some, not photographs, not aerial photographs, but drawings. It's a perfect setup, he says. <laughs> he says he can get down the side. He can get down and he can use the umbrellas to slide down a line he can make from a higher building that's across the street from the Pelican Arms uh, apartment building. It's a perfect plot for the penguin to, to jack this lady. And he's already got all the equipment in his criminal storeroom. So Penguin sends, spend, sends his men to the labeled criminal storeroom. That's pretty good. This is a, this episode is, is pretty good. I like this scheme. There's less action, but there's this is pretty good. So the Batmobile goes into action to try to rescue this lady. But wait, so why would he try to send, if Batman's going to stop a crime, why would Penguin send his guys to commit that crime? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a diversion. 
they're going to surprise the Batman. They're taking all the stuff Batman said to take, so the Batman would be prepared for them to take. Looks like they're going to have a nice bay at the beach, some umbrellas, and uh, a bunch of rope. Now we're back from commercial. We've got a jewel bedecked, uh, gold lame pants wearing Don Robbins. Who plays Don Robbins in this episode? Did you find out though? So we get a, a girl. That was something kind of missing from the first episode. We didn't have a Jill St. John. Don Robbins is played by a woman named Leslie Parrish. We had Madge Blake. Whoa. She was in the Manchurian Candidate. She's in Will Abner. Some crazy old. Uh, he had a long career. Not really. About 20 years. It's long enough. An actor. She started out in A Man Called Peter as an uncredited newlywed. A lot of uncredited work. No, any of these titles are really jumping out at me from my early days. One was called Hot Summer Night. Boy, that sounds like a good movie. It's the end of Hot Summer Night. He's on a TV series of the Roaring Twenties. I wonder if that was any good. It was a great movie. Well, she's on some episodes of Bat Masters and Oh, uh, Roaring Twenties. The Twenties was a show about a newspaper reporter in the town with lots of gangsters and cops. Kind of sounds fun. It looks like it was more like upbeat. Just from the photo, maybe it was a lie. She was also on some Bat Masterson, starring Gene Barry. We we're not really, really that familiar with, honestly. And Alan Jaffe, who I think was uh, in last episode. Yeah, Alan Jaffe was on Bat Masterson for seven episodes as a belligerent drunk and various things. So we have our first tie in here where. Both these people did work on Bat Masterson. It was nominated for one primetime Emmy Bat, the Bat Masterson program. He was a legendary gunman. And he became a sports writer also. A lot of people don't, uh, yeah. Bat Masterson kind of had a fascinating life. He was a Dodge City lawman, lived a long life. The series had a life of three seasons. Let's see, she was also in Portrait of a Mobster. So a lot of mob moles or something. I don't know. I'm making that up. Played Jocelyn Jer Jordan in the Manchurian Candy. A long time since I've seen that movie. Don't really remember any character names. Other than that. Uh, because she did not play Murder, She Wrote. Angela Lansbury. I guess she'll come back in other ep in another episode next season. Maybe a couple episodes. She has another role she plays. She plays a character named Glacia Glaze in uh, two episodes in 1967 of Batman. So she'll come back as a second character. This will be her only appearance as Don Robbins. Actress. Big time Hollywood movie star. Maybe she'll get murdered. That's why she doesn't come back as this character. Let's, let's find out. Hopefully she doesn't die. She's on the Logan's Run TV series. She's on a show called McLeod. Gee, huzzah, McLeod. Also on Mannix, perhaps even with Madge Blakely. Madge Blake. <laughs> what a drag it is for Don Robbins being so rich and so famous. Nothing ever exciting happens to her. But none never knows what lurks around life's corner, Ms. Robbins. Perhaps it could even be a Batman. It's a high penthouse terrace, so they can't use the batarang. It's too high, so they can't throw. Even Batman can't throw that far, so they have to use a batzuka. The penguin's setting up. You got a nice uh, map painting or something of the... Whoa, wait a second. Yeah, I like the Gotham City uh, thing here. But inside this lady's apartment, it's like there's supposed to be smoke in the air, but the smoke doesn't move. It's a still frame. You can see that the light and stuff, like for whatever reason, the smoke in her thing and the light, it's just, it's just a picture. It's very strange. But the background of Gotham City is pretty cool looking. I wish they used it more often already. It looks badass behind the Penguin. I'd love to have that. Is it, is it just like a view of Los Angeles? No way. It's got to be made up. It's got to be totally fake. This is in the studio, yeah. Here we got the uh, amazing crate. Oh, they're climbing. They use the Batzuka. They're climbing up the wall. No dialogue with them climbing this time, but we're in the. That's the third time we've seen them climb already. Two and two episodes. That's really lucky. Man, look at the door. Her penthouse has a really cool door. 
high ceilings. The door matches the ceiling, and it's a very uh, cool, very cool print. Psychedelic. She got a crazy clock in here. And she thinks Batman and Robin are from outer space. They're aliens. And he says, to, and he says uh, her agent or manager or something says, Great Scott, when they pop in. His uh, character was Mr. J, Dan Tobin. A lot of stuff. Whoa. He's in the other side of the wind. Another guy got a lot of uh, work. Let's see how many rolls total. He went from 1910 to 1982, and he acted in 128 things. Not as many as Eric Roberts, that's for sure. <laughs> but Miss Robbins, now she's introduced to... So Batman and uh, Robin, they have to tell them that they're... Uh, they're into, like, uh, they're not criminals. They're here to save her, and they're here to foil a daring crime. But she thinks Batman's cute and asks him if he wants some publicity, and her agent will say, no way, Batman's not into commercial enterprises. He doesn't, he's not here to make money. They, they fill her in that the plot is to kidnap her. There's no time to explain this. It's going to cost Ward Eagle thousands a day. I mean, that was, seemed like a plenty of time to explain. So they've got a penguin line. They're going to shoot like the bat rope. They've got a catapult thing here that is attached with a grappling hook. They've got like, but it's not a catapult. It looks more like a, like a crazy gun or something. I guess it is kind of, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but it looks cool, but then it works. So the penguin now zip lines across the nightscape. That looks cool. I do like the ones on that skyline. Oh, it wasn't smoke in the air. That's the crazy pattern of the door. It looked like smoke hanging in there in a still frame. But that's just how her door looks like. We got another guy zip lining across in the umbrella. Batman really did give them a cool scheme here. And they plug in a magnet once they're in to, to the inside. On the outside, they plug a magnet in. They use a gas to knock out the people inside. And then Batman and Robin once again have bust in. So they bust in and they're wearing their scuba gear again. Their little uh, ventilator mouth things that are very crazy. <laughs> this old time breathing apparatus. And the penguin's like, oh, you busted me, eh. But they use a ma they use a magnet now that attracts the utility belts. Their utility belts suck them to the wall. And Batman and Robin, Madam West and Burt Ward are drawn to that wall and have to press themselves against it and and try their best to get off that wall. They just can't get off it. They have to work so hard. There's like a winch. They, he gets Dawn. He gets the girl too. And they can't get their utility belts off. He's got the girl. So he really did use them being there. He was one step ahead. And they're still stuck there. They can't get the utility belts off. And he's getting away with the actress. We go into um, these Gotham City nightscapes. Look really cool. Very cool. With the, them going across their high lane burglary. I gotta say. Very cool. And uh, yeah, I wonder if these were reused or anything else. Or they get used again for the show. Or what are we looking at? It looks like it could be London, New York. I don't, I don't know my city. So I don't know what the cityscape is here. It doesn't look like they just invented all this for the show. It looks like this has got to be photographed, like based on something real. They look, uh, everything looks too mismatched and intricate. It looks really cool. Really cool. I highly doubt it's Los Angeles at night there, going out there and doing that. Unless they just got up on top of a really high building and did stuff. Hmm. I wonder if there's any trivia about this episode. I actually wouldn't mind knowing some things about this one. Oh, this came from a story in the comic books. They took it, and it was the meteorite that he attempts to steal instead of the kidnapping plot that it has in this episode. This is the first appearance of the Batzuka Doi. Couldn't have happened in earlier. We would have known in the last episode. And is uh but the hench penguin and his henchmen, they know about the Bat Zuka somehow. Uh, and I guess music and dialogue from this one appears in the TV soundtrack around album released in nineteen sixty six. And in this one penguin says 
he has a hideaway in Alaska, but he actually lives apparently in the South Pole or Southern Hemisphere, not the North Pole, a common misconception. Oh, penguins actually live in the Antarctic, uh, a common misconception that has appeared in productions over the centuries. So penguins don't like the North Pole. <laughs> it's a funny IMDb thing to have on there. Nothing about that city backdrop. One dawn's gone, but another comes. The date on. And they're still looking at that umbrella. Or they're taking it into... They and the uh, her agent, Mr. J, they've taken the umbrella into Commissioner Gordon's office. And Commissioner Gordon, it's dawn. It's been up all night. You see all these coffee cups. O'Hara's in there. They've been working at this all night. He's got the, the tie undone. And... His shirt, his shirt's uh, undone, his jacket's off. Yeah, this is a all night, up all night work and Commissioner Gordon. You see the imprint, he's been wearing his glasses and, the, <laughs> and they were saved eventually from their utility belts by a room service waiter who came in every night. They say, Mr. Chase, just like pay the ransom and then nothing matters but Dawn's safety and Mr. Eagle's shooting schedule. Batman only agrees with the first part, but they have the money right here in the suitcase. The thing of the man's. <coughs> and we see um, what look to be very, very real dollar bills here. <laughs> Certainly not some kind of monopoly money. No funny money here. That's that's some really hard U.S. currency. Or in a red suitcase. <laughs> I really gotta say that thing. The umbrella of Penguin sent them with the clue. It's an ugly umbrella. And similarly, they're kind of sending them an ugly suitcase. They're gonna meet in a neutral spot. The penguin is set up and he's gonna have a mild sedative or something on the girl. And <coughs> it'll wear off. But she'll be unharmed. And he wants to meet them in front in the front hall of Wayne Manor. And Commissioner O'Hare explains to that is the home of Adam West, the millionaire, Bruce Wayne. Hey, it's 420. You know what time that is? Time to check that sweet potato. Time, they're immediate at 10 a.m. Uh. So Batman says there's no choice. They gotta go there. And Mr. J's like, come on, of course. He has wasting time. Get the balloon. Oh yeah, they want a balloon. Money in a balloon or something. We should probably set that up. So they're gonna pay two hundred thousand dollars. And Batman and Robin are gonna deliver this ransom money themselves. Let's see what happens here is they've got the umbrella in there. And so the penguin can hear everything they're saying. So he says, so Batman and Robin said they're gonna deliver the money themselves, but then Batman remembers from the society ball some photographs the Wayne Manor has a two suits of armor in it. And that he and, and Rob was like, oh yeah, we'll hide in those. And then we'll get the penguin. <coughs> He's like, the last trick of this tricky hand is ours. And Penguin and his boys laugh. Penguin flanked by his two finks is like a really, really good shot once again, just like in episode one, laughing at Batman. <coughs> 10 a.m. is coming. Alfred's looking at the uh, thing. We see the two suits of armor with their arms raised. It's got to get tiring. Ooh, the bell rings and somebody with an umbrella is at the door and knocks Alfred out with, the, with gas from the umbrella. <clears throat> then two men, Penguin's henchmen, in with scary, scary masks come in and then they, they put Alfred aside and Penguin follows them in. He looks at the uh, suit of armor immediately. And gas is a, one of the two suits of armor. Looks to be the one with Robin. Yes. And Robin is out cold. And the other one does not move. Makes no evasive action. And gets gassed. So Batman is gassed, is gassed as well. And we see that he is sleeping, standing up, and quite, quite happily, it seems. Nice smile on Adam West's face. Peaceful slumber. <clears throat> Her slumber is, they bring in Dawn, uh, 
Don Robbins, and her slumber is peaceful as well. As his gas is does produce a, a pleasant slumber. Yeah, here's where he says, in 18 hours when they awake, he'll be safe in his hideaway in Alaska. 18 hour drug. And Mrs. Cooper comes in and asks if it was the cleaning man. She finds everybody knocked out. <clears throat> And she sees Alfred with Don Robbins, and she thinks that Alfred and this girl are getting it on. Of course, she has no idea people are inside her suits of armor or Master Wayne's. And Penguin, oh, wow. <clears throat> so they go back to the... They go back to the... The uh, hideout. The Umbrella Factory. Slash Umbrella Shop. And... Batman and Robin bust down of the secret elevator to the Umbrella store. And they say, no, 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 Penguin. You are not going to get away scot-free with this money, this $200,000 in his red suitcase. Quite contraire, you betrayed yourself back at the penthouse. Maybe by using the same words Batman had used in the Batcave, he knew it was too, he was like, hey, wait, this is exactly what I said. Which is it shows Batman's incredible memory of his what he what he says. I I ever remember things I say. Well, I don't know. Yeah, in, in exact wording like that, but Batman does. They acted out a charade to trap him. <clears throat> Those were dummies in the armor, not the real Batman and Robin. That explains why they could hold their arm up so high for so long, not just discipline, and how high Batman wouldn't have moved. See, I would have thought when I gassed Robin. That Batman, I guess he couldn't turn his head and look without giving himself away. That he would guess something like this. <laughs> so Batman and Robin then try to fight them with umbrellas? Yeah. So they get in a fight with these guys and Batman and Robin grab the first weapons on hand, which are umbrellas. <laughs> And so Batman and Robin are fighting Penguin and his men in a duel in like umbrellas. And Robin's umbrella opens on his own accord and flies away as this Batman's. Very strange. Now we get into some onomatopoeia fighting. Let's see what the band's cooked up for us this time. <laughs> <laughs> the sounds of the umbrellas flying away from their hands are very crazy. Why do they fly up like that? I don't know. By a physical pow. Oof. Crunch. Bam. Zlonk. Clunk. With a crazy shot of Robin laughing gleefully when he clunks the heads together, like a wide-angle lens, very tight in on Robin or something. That's something, just something like there's something weird about Burt Ward here laughing. It almost doesn't look like Burt Ward to me. I think Burt Ward looks like he's been getting more rest. And they they overcome the penguin and his men and Chief Iron and his guys. They come in to say to wrap it up, and uh, what's his face says. Um, Tell Warden Crichton they better keep these guys on ice. They keep better on ice. <laughs> they keep better on ice. Cool. There are some shrimps and shrimp salad and hors d'oeuvres. Wait a second, I'm getting a message as we record this from ED. Hey, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turns out ED and I will be perhaps in the same place at the same time, partying down around the H-O-L-I-D-A-Y-S. Oh yeah. We should hang out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it my idea, I won't ask me. More than once even. Yeah. I'm gonna ask him if his lady friend is with him as well. Wouldn't mind seeing her for non-amorous relatives. So that kind of a suggestive voice. But no. <laughs> but no, that's not what I mean. She's quite a nice lady. Because she's there too. You know, like I was telling somebody about this uh, ED's lady. It's like, you know, sometimes there's a lady and you can't, like, uh, be like, oh, yeah, she's not like uh, ED's lady is like one of the guys, but she's also one of the gals. She's very, very, very great person. Like, if you know, there's a person who's like excellent personality, 
she's also beautiful but she's like she has an excellent personality I'd really like to hang out with this lady now, i know many a guy who has tried to uh to get her to be unfaithful to ed but ed in spite of his name is not uh is not to be trifled with this way so now we're back to the plot we'll wait for ed's reply and then there was a party at at the wayne manor there are girls there's some guy here that looks familiar himself looks like he could be dick grayson's stunt double or something yeah and and and, and, and Bert ward's trying to fill up on uh, hors d'oeuvres and and Carrot is really like taking him to task that after all the shrimp salads no indeed Greg Grace, Dick Grayson she's not going to see him have nightmares their house she says bad enough their home was involved in a wicked crime last week much less Dick Grayson eating too many hors d'oeuvres and shrimp salad and she's like she's like she's like well, you saw what i saw and she looks at alfred because she knows he was next to that holy movie star and she thinks that they were involved in some kind of untoward doings of the sexual variety and to adam west says he and dick grayson were off uh he's this easy batman now like we're rather adam west He's in his manner, and he's telling the story of like what happened with the crime to three chicks who were talking to him with like frosted hair and stuff, like three society ladies who who are, he's towers above, and he holds a drink, and it's like he uh, so he and Bert Ward were out of town. He's like, "Hey, ladies, let's go ask Commissioner Gordon about all this. He'd know more about it than me. I was out of town." And, the, and Commissioner Gordon is now going to give us the, he's telling some people at the party what the origin of the bat costume is. Pretty cool. And he said, nothing. Batman has a, real, has a simple idea. And he knows it to be true when he set on those quests that nothing, nothing on earth frightens the mind of a criminal like the shape and shadow of a huge bat. Nothing. Nothing. That is the origin. And Ms. Robbins and Mr. J come to the party. She seems utterly bored with Bruce Wayne. She doesn't want to talk to him at all. She's like, he's like, Mr. J is trying to show him off as this rich man. And she's like, ah, I'm not into this. And she's like, you did grace. And it's like, what's the matter with this bitch? Maybe it's that criminal gas lingering effects. And then Mr. J's like, no, no, it's much more tragic than that. Much, much more tragic indeed, Mr. Wade. It was a hopelessly in love after a glimpse of our unknown savior, Batman. And Batman, Adam West, will have to surfeit his appetites with uh, the society ladies. We have the end of episode two. For episode four and that brings us to the end of episode two here let's see what ed wrote us back here in these text messages before we sign off I'm glad to, his lady is with him and he is uh and i uh I let him know i'm coming into town mm -hmm. all right well, i'm excited he'll be in town for what well, seems like not as long as i will i'll be there for a while in fact we'll have already met by the time I probably, probably hear this. <laughs> Audio scumbags. See you next time. Same bat time. Same Adam. Who's that at the door, Alfred? If it's the cleaning man. Oh, Alfred. Oh, oh come on, Aunt Harriet. Just one more hors d'oeuvre, huh? After all that shrimp salad. No, indeed, Dick Grayson. I'm not going to say you have nightmares. It's bad enough that our peaceful home was involved in a wicked crime last week. My, oh, my, if you had seen what I saw.